Today we're taking a look at the Apple Macintosh SE30. The SE30, for those of you who don't know, came out in January of 1989. It's almost 2019 as of the making of this video, which means this machine is almost 30 years old. The SE30 in the name, SE stands for System Expansion. The 30 stands for 68030, the Motorola processor at the heart of this machine. Unfortunately, because this machine is so old, it has a few problems. And so instead of being a happy Mac, he's a sad Mac. And this video is going to take a look on how to make him happy once again. So here is our Macintosh SC30, which has a problem. You can hear that it's making a very strange noise. Also, you can see that the screen is not coming on, or at least partially does. It has some serious problems. At the back of the SE30, we're measuring voltage now at the floppy disk connector. You can see the red probe is on the upper left pin, which should be 5 volts normally, and the black probe is on the little bolt there, which is ground. So as you can see here, we're getting fluctuating voltage instead of a rock-solid 5 volts, which is the whole problem, and points to a power supply problem. Now it's time to remove the case of the SE30. I've already removed the screws, but just to let you know, there's four, and they're Torx T15. Okay, um, here's one, here's the other, and there's two more deep down in the handle. Now to get the handle screws out, you'll want to have a long Torx. I would say at least a foot long, more than 30 centimeters. So you can get the, the, uh, the neck of the Torx deep down in there, and then the top you'll be twisting here um, outside the case. Okay? And you, you can see here I've got a bubble wrap thing here. You can use a bed or something else. Obviously, an anti-static surface would be better, and really this bubble wrap isn't anti-static, but since we're just removing the back of the case for now, it's okay. You want to have a soft surface face down, some people uh, recommend what's called a mat cracker in order to help get the back case off, but honestly, the SC30 itself is pretty heavy, so if you just grab it by two edges like this and yank on it a few times up, then you'll eventually be able to get it off, and you won't need any special tool. So I'll go ahead and do that now. And it didn't take much effort. So here's another view. This is this is the SE30 power supply. You can see the on-off switch here, and that's where it plugs in. It has a little ground that grounds the frame of the um, power supply to the metal chassis. And then, of course, it connects to this board back here, which is the analog board, through one cable. Here's the analog board of the SE30. And in order to remove the power supply, we first have to remove uh, this little metal shield here which goes around the motherboard and then we can see there are screws here's one two three four that we need to remove but we can't just remove those screws and pull out only the power supply we actually have to take off the whole analog board which means we need to start by removing the analog board screws which over here are these two screws and then we have two screws down here so these four screws, the bottom left and the far right, we need to remove first so that we can remove it. And um, if you do remove these four screws, that's fine. And actually, it might be easier. Uh, that way, you can remove the analog board uh, to do that. Now, just to let you know, this little message here tells you it's high voltage. So if you've just turned it on and turned it off, you're still going to have voltage in there. Now, I'm not going to go into in-depth uh, about the discharging of the CRT, but basically, you don't want to put your hand on this, okay? You can see the live wires there. You don't want to grab this with your hand, um, at least not until the bleeder resistor has bled off the voltage. It, some say it might take an hour. It might take overnight. Uh, eventually, it will bleed down. Some people say, well, you should discharge it anyway because what if the bleeder resistor is broken, yada, yada, yada. To protect yourself, you should discharge the CRT 
There are special discharge tools that you can buy, or you can just get a, a flathead screwdriver that has an alligator clip, right, like this. You can just connect that to uh, a screwdriver and then slip your screwdriver in here after you've grounded it to this ground lug. So this is, don't do it to the frame. Don't do it to the frame, the metal frame of the case, but you would connect one end of your ground, of your, your ground to this ground lug here, okay? And then you would connect the other end to a screwdriver and then slip the screwdriver down into the suction cup until you hear a pop. If you don't hear a pop, you either didn't connect it or it's already discharged. So there's a lot of videos you can see, uh, you know, if you search for discharge compact max CRT, you'll find in more information. So I'm not going to go in depth into it, but you should discharge the CRT because you're going to be removing uh, the analog board. And if you want to get it completely out of your way, then you're going to need to remove this cup. And to do that, you want to have it sufficiently discharged. And for those of you who just as an aside, who have a keen eye and said, hey, this isn't your stock fan. That's right, I swapped it out for a Silinx 60 millimeter because it runs quieter than the stock Elena brand fan. Also, you probably noticed these wires up here that run from the back of the uh, CRT to the analog board. I had a bad connector connection there with uh, bad solder joints and the, the connector actually had burned. So what I did is I, uh, needed to elongate the wires and I soldered them in directly uh, to the analog board. But these are the two things that are non-stock on this particular SE30. Since I determined that I needed a new power supply for my SE30, rather than taking a shot in the dark and buy uh, something untested, what I did is jump on over to the old standby, the 68 K MLA forums. This is a place where vintage Mac uh, users can assemble together and uh, talk to each other about their modifications or repairs. Uh, the 68K MLA, MLA is in all caps because it stands for Macintosh Liberation Army. Uh, they have a compact Mac uh, forum, or you could call it sub forum here that pertains to, you can see, the 512, the original Mac, the SC, SC30, and so on. And this is the forum in which I decided to post uh, the modern PSU for the SC30, appealing for uh, some assistance. And I mentioned that there is one seller in Japan that has one ready-made, just that he wanted $200 for it, and I wanted more than one. So what was everyone else doing? That's the kind of question I put forth and I immediately started to get uh, responses. And um, I'd like to actually thank uh, Joe the Zombie. Uh, he is one who uh, sent me some private messages and also posted in this forum uh, details of what he did. Uh, and then there are some other people who, you know, they mentioned ATX power supplies, how uh, they used those uh, to swap out the guts, the internals of their own uh, original stock uh, power supply. And so, of course, through this discussion, I continued to ask questions, and uh, Joe the Zombie was very helpful. Super Jer 2000, I'd also like to offer some thanks to him as well, because he contributed to this thread uh, in purchasing the same replacement power supply that uh, Joe the Zombie did, and we will, if I can find it here, uh, by the way, if you, s you can see some pictures here, this, the power supply with all of these slits, this is not a Sony power supply, there were actually two manufacturers, this is an Aztec uh, power supply, so the frame, the metal frame of it, uh, looks a bit different on the top and on the sides. And so, of course, um, they're showing how uh, he took the internals of a power supply called the Seasonic out of its enclosure and took the fan out and how he uh, assembled on that. So um, Super JR2000, uh, Joe the Zombie. And uh, if we go to page 5 here in the discussion, it's quite a long discussion, we see that Vaughn, I'd also like to thank him because he presented the, the staple trick um, that makes it easy if you don't have a tool to 
remove pins. And of course, he purchased the same power supply as well. You can see he's got the uh, Seasonic uh, power supply in here. And what he did to put it in is he used <laughs> these wire ties uh, to put that into his uh, original stock power supply enclosure. And then he's showing uh, the harness here. So the actual model number is SSP-250SUB. And it was because of that I checked out the specifications, which you can see here. You've got um, uh, at 3.3 volts, 14 amps, 5 volts, 17 amps, 12 volts. You've got two of them. Each are, are rated at 12 amps each, minus 12.8. And then, of course, you've got um, another plus 5 over here which is something special that wouldn't need to be used. So I asked questions, well, what is uh, the, you know, I metered, uh, I actually purchased one, and um, this is more than enough for all of the 5 volt, 12 volt, minus 12 volt, and everything. It's far more than the original stock SE30 power supply was. And so where did I find it? eBay. This is actually the exact seller I used iMicros. You can see it over here on this side. Um, you know, it's maybe not so cheap, especially for me. I had to buy it and get it shipped to Japan. You can see what the shipping cost is here. So my total cost was pretty high for it. But it's the right size. And I saw everybody, you know, some people removed the guts out of it, took off the whole case. Um, and you just saw the photo that um, showed, well, you can actually keep the case intact and put it inside. Um, you'll just have to address the power cord and how you're going to connect that. But I have some ideas on how I'm going to do it, and I the ideas are different than what everybody showed on the 68K MLA. So the next step is to show you that power supply. Okay, so we have our Seasonic power supply and its harness here. And what I'm going to show you is how to remove the wires. We have certain wires that we know, 10 of them, uh, that are going to be need to be removed. We've got a minus 12 volts, that's one. We've got uh, two 5 volt wires that we need. And we've got a, a two plus 12 volts. Technically, these are isolated, should be, but um, two 12 volts. And then the other five, the remaining five, uh, are ground. I've already disconnected some. We've got the 12 volts, uh, the 5 volts, and we've got our minus uh, 12 volt, which is uh, the blue wire. And I've got one of the grounds. So we're going to take off four more. And I'm, this, this is just going to show you how we're going to do it. And I saw another YouTube video that showed these number three staples, uh, you can just take off the staples and um, cut them into an L shape. The L shape will allow you to get down into the connector. So the connector on the Seasonic harness that we're going to pull the wires from is this white connector. There are many other connectors uh, on the Seasonic. You know, this is your standard a hard disk, uh, IDE hard disk power connector, or for a SCSI, old SCSI drive, the power connector for that. Um, you don't want to remove any any wires that come out of the big black connector, though, because um, this is the connector that must attach uh, to your Seasonic. So now, how are we going to use uh, these staples and the answer is on the edge of each pin there's a little wing that flips out and so we're going to use these staples to just push them straight down on either side because there's two wings for each pin okay and so we're going to just push them down and take it out now I'm, I'm I only need the grounds so We'll take out uh, one of the grounds here. All right. So to take out this ground, I want to push down 
And then we're going to take the other staple and put it on the other side. a little bit bent here but if I did it correctly then you can pull out the wire and there it went and so <clears throat> I need five black wires total uh, which means I need to pull three more out of here with my staple trick here is our SC30 stock power supply. It only has two cables coming out, just the ground, which I just showed you, that attaches to the chassis, and then this little short cable, which plugs into the analog board. Here's the switch down at the bottom, and these are the two over here. These two uh, connectors were what I used uh, to cut off these wires, and I left the other wires uh, intact. And of course this up here is your three prong power connector with the green wire being your earth ground. I couldn't tell if any capacitors had leaked. I don't see, I just see a lot of flux here. Uh, so technically speaking this power supply still might work um, if it's recapped. So I'm not going to throw it away or destroy it. What we want to do is remove all of the wires out of this stock connector um, for the power supply. Take them all out so that we can use this connector. Now you could buy another one if you want to, um, but I'm lazy and this connector is a little bit yellowed, but uh, it's still good enough. So that's what I'm going to do using the staple trick. I remove all 10 of these wires and then I'm going to take the wires that I removed out of the Seasonic white connector and obviously they're not color matched so you're gonna have to be careful about that but um, since I have the schematic I know what goes where and first remove these then put these wires into the appropriate spots into this connector and here we are we have our cable all finished, all of the wires from the original Seasonic harness have now been put into this connector which is from the SE30. You might say, well, what happened to all of the other wires? And the answer is, I removed them. And you can see I used the uh, little staple trick to remove them all and if we look up close at the connector you can see a lot of empty holes there and uh, where you see the copper is where I have the the wires in there and uh, some of the wires were uh, spliced there's two wires uh, to the same terminal and so I just cut those off and um, I didn't cut it off at the base because, well, I probably won't reconnect anything, but who knows. So I cut it off, uh, left a couple centimeters, cut it off flat, and then I put some heat shrink tubing uh, a little bit beyond the wire. So there's no way that these are going to short on anything. And, of course, the green wire that you see here uh, is the loop wire that needs to, to go to ground. It's a loop wire now, anyway. Uh, this wire has to be grounded for the Seasonic to power on. So all I did was just take uh, the opposite end of it and plug it into where one of the ground wires used to be. And so now it's permanently grounded. Uh, since there's no way for the SE30 to take advantage of it, you might as well just permanently ground it and then the actual power switch on the SE30 housing will be what turns it on and off, which is really how it should be. And so when we plug in our connector, uh, it's keyed. So even though some of the terminals are missing, it really doesn't matter. And it locks in very securely. We can now do some open circuit voltage measurements here. I'm going to plug in power. We'll start off by putting our black probe to one of the grounds. 
then measure uh, one of the yellow wires here. And we get 12.3. We do the other one. We get 12.3. Do the red. We get 5.13. And do the blue. We get minus 12.15. These are pretty much spot on. When I did the open circuit measurements of the stock uh, SE30 power supply, um, I was getting only about minus 9 on the negative. So again, the capacitors were old, so it's no surprise. And for the um, uh, positive 5 line, I was getting actually 5.5 volts, and this open circuit voltage is a little bit closer to 5. Uh, for the, the 12 volt line, it's pretty close to 12 here, but on the stock SC30 uh, power supply Sony version, I was getting, oh goodness, almost 14 volts. Uh, but of course, when you put a load on it, it drops down uh, pretty quickly. So anyway, this is just a no load situation showing you what the open circuit voltages are. The fan, of course, is turned off. It won't turn on until you put a load on it or otherwise heat it up. So here's the stock uh, Sony power supply. Just for frame of reference, uh, the harness is going to come out the top here. And there's really not a lot of length uh, in the wires. And now we have the Seasonic inside. You can see how much smaller it is. It fits perfectly inside. And we're also going to have plenty of wire length, so a bit longer than the original, so no problems there. Um, I've seen some people who actually remove this metal enclosure and take out the raw circuit board and mount it, but uh, you're going to change the airflow if you do that. I'm not saying it's bad, it's just one way to do it. An easier way perhaps, and I've seen another person do this, is to take wire ties and just mount this in here, and that way your fan is uh, well, is going to work the way it was intended originally. The only issue that we just have to deal with is the three-prong connector uh, connecting those three wires, ground and then two AC wires over here to the switch, ground to ground of course, and then the two AC wires down uh, to the switch in there. And here is the finished product. As you can see I decided that it was best to remove the top of the Seasonic so it, the actual guts of it is exposed. But I left uh, the other part of the frame intact and I did not remove the fan. So the fan is there. Uh, I left that in there just because there's still going to be airflow the way it was originally intended. But I needed to remove the top because I decided to connect the power cable uh, to bypass that power plug and solder in wires on the inside. You can also see a couple of bolts here, here and over here uh, that I used. I didn't have to drill. Uh, I just used the existing holes in the Sony uh, metal chassis to be able to mount the Seasonic and with those two bolts there it is very secure. And so here's the flip side. I This is the inside here and you can see I've got one of the, the bolts here and the other bolt uh, is down here. You can see that I used an old power cord. Uh, I still left some of the outer black uh, insulation on it. And it has, of course, three wires on the inside, the uh, two AC wires, and then, of course, the earth ground. And I, you can see here I've connected the earth ground to the ground pin on the uh, chassis here. And then all three wires go down in here. And you can see how I have the wires, all three of them coming in. It's just the reverse side of this 3-pin power connector and uh, was not difficult to uh, put those in. And you can see the um, white and black wire there connected to the back of the switch. And here is our fully reassembled power supply with the Seasonic inside. You can see the cable there is shortened to be just perfect. Uh, with no unnecessary slack outside the box there for connecting to the analog board. Well, we now have the SE30 open. The motherboard is not yet put back in. And I can show you how I dealt 
uh, with the screws on the power supply. Since I made the decision to put these two screws to hold in the Seasonic within the uh, uh, PSU frame, uh, obviously I needed to do some cutting. So I had a pair of handheld cutters that allowed me to cut out this little H-shaped piece, which um, came out without too much effort. I had to cut six uh, places there, and I also had to cut, I actually used a little drill to drill multiple holes so I could cut out a little section here so that this and this screw uh, would be able to come through. Otherwise, the power supply wouldn't be able to fit in there. And I did not consider uh, cutting out this little H piece a problem because it does not adversely affect the strength or integrity uh, of this entire frame here, the chassis, and if anything it out allows air to flow a little bit better. And here's the bottom screw. You can see how I used uh, a small drill bit to drill multiple holes around there and then I was able to use my clippers to clip off that metal piece there allowing the screw uh, to fit through. Well here we are with our Seasonic inside. We've got the power connected all ready to go. I've got some boot floppies over here ready but let's give the smoke test as they say, the power on test. Here we go. Boot chime. Screen coming on. Nice and perfect as it should be. Got my arrow cursor here moving around as it should be. Okay. Um, it's probably checking the memory. Right now I've got 32 megabytes of RAM in there and it takes a little while. But uh, as we can see here, the disk icon is on there with the flashing question mark asking what are we going to do so I've got a what's called a floppy EMU over here and I'm going to just boot off of that system uh, 6.0.8 And what do you know? There it goes. The floppy EMU is pretty neat. I'm not uh, that would be a subject for another video, but basically the floppy EMU simulates uh, a normal floppy and allows you to well, you connect to the back by the floppy connector and as you can see, we just booted off of it. Here's a zoom shot of the screen. Um, I don't have the battery in there, so I'm moving the mouse around like crazy and, it's, and the arrow's not going very far, but this is just showing you that the machine's working. Uh, this is still using the floppy EMU. It's just as slow as a normal floppy would be. So you don't get any uh, acceleration enhanced speed when you're using this floppy EMU. And even closing <laughs> the close box here is taking time. So we have to go to the control panel and everything because you don't have the battery in there so everything gets reset to the defaults and we can see our dates wrong and you know there's different things that you'd want to set unfortunately this is just the basics and doesn't include the mouse but um, I can include I can drop in a floppy here our actual floppy just so that we can see that the floppy drive works and there the system disk came up you can launch disk first aid off the floppy and here we're checking along so this is the stock SE30 with no acceleration 16 megahertz which compared to models the, of the Compact Mac prior to this one, that's actually pretty snappy, but uh, not as snappy as it would be with an accelerator. But thanks to the new power supply, we will have the power uh, to do that. 
Okay, so let's do shutdown. It says you may safely do the restart, so let's restart. Continuing on our testing here. And this time I will boot from this floppy and not the floppy EMU, just to show you that it will also boot. So it's booting off the floppy. So we can see here that the power supply has basically given this computer new life. And for the last test, I'll just show you the floppy EMU. You've got Apple II, Lisa, Macintosh. Uh, since this is a Macintosh, uh, we'll use this. Um, and just show you one of the more famous games, Beyond Dark Castle, that will go ahead and boot from this. So this is one of the more popular games of the time and uh, we won't go ahead and spend any more time playing it but I'll just, 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 just to show you that this machine truly is in full working order and the uh, computer has the screen stable uh, the audio is stable. Now, of course, the audio doesn't just depend on the power supply. It depends on your circuit board as well. But we can see that really the main problem of this machine was its power supply. And now it's working once again. And here's the back at the floppy connector once again. What I have connected here is the floppy EMU connector. We'll go ahead and disconnect this so that we can do another. Again, it's powered off. Uh, we'll do another voltage test again, this time uh, with the Seasonic. We can see we're getting stable voltage now. Not quite uh, 5 volts because I'm measuring at the floppy connector and um, I'd probably, if I could scratch off some of this rust here and get a better contact point, it might go up a little bit. Um, but 9.2 volts is uh, not too unexpected here and compared to what we saw at the beginning it's not fluctuating um, the, the small fluctuations here that you see are are really uh, not a problem at all so we're getting a solid voltage from the Seasonic so I just switch to a different pin and I, we get the a 12 volts on that so we're getting 5 volts uh, and 12 volts at the floppy connector so this is confirming and we just confirmed it on the screen as well that everything's okay. Well I'm still measuring at the floppy connector as you can see but you'll notice we're getting a rock solid 4.99 volts now. So how did I accomplish this you ask? I recapped the analog board. Now this is still powered on so I obviously don't want to stick my finger there but I changed all the electrolytic capacitors. I'll do another video on that. But basically the effect of putting proper capacitors on this analog board boosted uh, the voltage output a little bit. So now it's, it's a rock solid 5 volts. And you can see I've got an internal hard drive um, connected here. I don't have any upgrades in the PDS slot, but I can show you that now. So just to show you the power hungry boards that I'm going to put in there, um, I've got a Daystar uh, 40 megahertz 68040 uh, accelerator card. This is the top end card, about the best you can get uh, to boost your SE30's processor performance. We've got a MacCon Ethernet card here um, that uh, will let you have Ethernet. And yes, you can connect to the internet with it. And then this is a Twin Spark TS adapter from ArtMix Japan. This thing. <laughs> Uh, it looks fairly simple, but it cost me about $200 equivalent uh, back some years ago when I purchased it. And they're still selling them today, but what this is, is it will allow you to plug in. It's a splitter, and it's an adapter. So this card requires an adapter, and even though it doesn't require a splitter, the splitter will allow me to plug in this card and my Ethernet card too. So this will be a good test. Uh, to see the power draw and how low the voltage will go at the floppy connector and of course I still have my internal hard drive too. 
And here it is with the cards installed. Now I have it booted off the internal hard drive. And because, unfortunately, my internal drive doesn't have its uh, terminating resistor blocks installed and I don't have any to put in there, what I'm doing is I'm putting a SCSI cable to my external uh, hard disk 20SC enclosure, which has a drive inside, which has its terminator on. So even though it's not powered up, it doesn't have to be, it's just resistive. So just this cable, all it's doing, this cable is just terminating the internal drive. And I am booted uh, into the System 7 here, and I've got my uh, Norton Utilities System Info, which is a benchmark utility, which um, will really test a variety of things. And you can see, of course, it's got the 68040 in there, running at 40 megahertz, SE30, um, and it has the built-in FPU. So we'll get this started and then check the voltage. And here's the voltage. So it's still running the test and we're getting about 4.82 volts uh, with it all running. Lower than five, but uh, we've got a lot of things taxing the system. And again, the internal hard drive is pulling power through the analog board, um, which is, yes, it's recapped. And uh, this is what we are getting. And the motherboard is also recapped. So this voltage level is stable. Uh, I'm not getting any lockups or freezes with it. And with the uh, original power supply, of course, was, was faulty, but even when it was good, um, I wasn't quite getting this voltage level at the floppy disconnector. Now, if I move my ground, my ground probe to another point, uh, we can see it's roughly it depends on where I, I test. I'm probing around at different points. But yeah, it's roughly 4.81. So it's, it's not... I'm touching the uh, metal frame um, at different points. And then on the power supply metal itself. And then now back at the floppy disk connector ground. And so it's not an issue of the ground that's affecting it. The original voltage that I showed prior to this test was the actual analog board not being recapped. And so there you have it. I deem it a success. And here's the close of our test. Just finishing the FPU. And it's now going to give us a score. I tested it before under 8.1. If you've got a special ROM, you can boot into 8.1 and 7.6, but it's comparable. It's comparable. So it's just under a Quadra 950, and it's faster than a Quadra 700 with a cash card. So let's go ahead and quit this and end it on a positive note with, you guessed it, Beyond Dark Castle. All right. So we'll see, we've got the sound on here. We'll just go ahead and do the demo for you. Games are, well, if you're into the old black and white games, these are pretty fun. And probably the most enjoyable of all of the games that I had was Dark Castle, both uh, the original and this one, which is the sequel called Beyond Dark Castle. A very fun game. And really surprisingly so. Because it's in black and white. And we're not even in, in grayscale here. This is either white or black pixels. But this was really one of the ultimate games of the time. Just due to the detail in the game itself. Because someone of course drew all of this by hand painstakingly so, and did a fine job. I mean, really did great artwork for this being made for a non-color screen. He's going to bash the guy and then get past him. So I'm not going to just, uh, you know, spend the whole time on this particular game. We'll go ahead and quit out of here. Uh, 
I put one more on here. Crystal Quest. Some of you may know Crystal Quest. I have to use the mouse here. And it's got momentum, so it's not as easy as it looks. Oops, I lost it. <laughs> and that's your objective. You just get all of these little guys here. And you ha if I click the mouse button, I can shoot. Oh, he's coming after me. And once you get all of them, then the little mouth at the bottom opens and you can go through and the little woman's voice is, uh, well, she likes it quite a lot. And then uh, it gets harder and harder as you go. And you don't want to land on the little mines and, and all of that. Ah, can I get through without dying? Ooh, I did. And I think if I press space... Yeah, you can do an obliteration of all of the bad guys, which is important if you, um, you know, if they're filling the screen. Oh, I died. Okay, well, I'll just quit out of here. Anyway, folks, this machine is working well again, thanks to a new power supply. And just to let you know, the operating system I'm running System 7.1. It's a bit, out of all of the System 7 flavors, I would say it's the fastest. And with a 40 megahertz 040 accelerator, uh, it is extremely fast. And there you have it, folks. Uh, we have transformed this SE30 from being a sad Mac, which, as you just saw, had some pretty serious problems, to becoming a very happy Mac. And the good news is that uh, you can do the same thing. You can do the transformation simply by replacing what is inside your SE30s stock power supply enclosure. You could recap, I meaning change out all of the capacitors on the existing one, and it would probably be working fairly well. But if you have other upgrades, accelerators, a lot of memory, it actually would be a benefit to you to have something more powerful. And that is exactly what we did with the Seasonic. It offers uh, many more amperes for 5 volt and 12 volt lines, which are important for this machine. Now, if you are replacing your power supply because you have a problem, you might also consider changing out the uh, capacitors on your analog board and also the motherboard, the logic board. Uh, maybe you don't have serious problems to the same level that this one had, but uh, maybe you have on your SE30 or even an SE uh, unexplainable freeze that very well could be due to dirty power. Uh, maybe for just a, a little a few milliseconds, an instant, uh, the power dipped below what was acceptable and your motherboard locked up. So after all of these years, it really is worth considering the power supply to make sure that you're supplying your motherboard with the kind of stable power that it really needs to function properly, especially if you have upgrades. In fact, that's really the main reason to have an SE30 because the E in SE is expansion and you can use that PDS processor direct card uh, to good use with an accelerator. So I hope this video has been helpful uh, to those of you who have watched and endured uh, the length of it, and thanks for watching.